Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, this is going to be our final uh, week, week number 10, on the study uh, about uh, early church history and the uh, reading uh, from the four Gospels. So actually the reading from the four Gospels is uh, part three of this lesson and uh, we'll kind of jump uh, from the last week and uh, try to cover uh, part three and if we have any time left then we may go back and do uh, some of those overview of church history. Uh, so out of viewing whole church history until now then we are focusing on the very beginning how it began and we took a majority of time to look at the, the root the, the before the actual New Testament church began So basically, the history, the Christian history, uh, there's Old Testament period and then New Testament period until now. It goes on. And there are 400 silent years kind of dividing to period, separating, separating to the period. And then New Testament period the history will end. It's going to be the end. With the end comes the kingdom complete. That's how we view the Christian, I mean, how us Christians view the history. And before the end, there's gonna be There's going to be the final judgment, tribulation, whatever. Then, uh, and then I mean, Amagathon and all these things are included here. And then that's where the second coming of Messiah, the Jesus Christ, second coming, coming up in the air, in, in, in the clouds, from the heaven coming down, descending because he was ascended and now he is descending and then it's going to be the, the kingdom and then you you heaven and earth and so on and the very beginning of New Testament that's where the full Four Gospels. Four Gospels as basically the recording of the the birth and the life and the ministry or the work of Jesus Christ as a Messiah or the Messiah. I'm sorry, as the Messiah. And then. Another, another record about the church is 
going to be the acts as a narrative, as a story of the work of the apostles or the, actually the work of the Holy Spirit. So that's the kind of overview, the picture. And the part three today is going to try to cover and focus on this full gospel because it shows how the church had begun. I Last week I told you again that I consider the, the very beginning of the church as when the Jesus Christ was baptized by the John the Baptist at the river of Jordan. And then there's a, the baptism of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus. And then Jesus began to gather his disciples. And the first two disciples are the, the disciple of John the Baptist who kind of moved transition to Jesus Christ from John the Baptist. So that kind of, you know, have a legal uh, concept or biblical doctrinal concept it fulfills the doctrinal concept of church, which two or more gathered under the name of Jesus Christ, under the name of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm going to be there with you. So that's how it began for me. Some believe the Pentecost is the beginning of the church, but uh, I, I consider the beginning of church a little earlier than that. So as, as we do the reading from the Gospels, we are going to see this. Lesson one. Four Gospels with the perspectives. Uh, the perspective that reading the full Gospel as the, the, the story of a church. Considering the band or the group of Jesus and his 12 disciples as a church. Because it, it brings us teach us the very principles of church, what the church is and what the church does. When we are dealing with a living entity or living thing, whether it's a plant, and plant does not, uh, it does. Plant, animal, people, or angels, spirits, God, Jesus Christ, whoever that is a living being. There's a part of being and doing. Same with the church. Church, what it does, what it is. So that kind of full gospel gives that, that very picture, the principle, the lessons about what the church is and what the church does. A lot more than what we find in the book of Acts, where it, where it records the Pentecost and uh, whatever happened uh, after that. So let's go into the lesson one and try to read this full Gospels. Why full Gospels? So there are four Gospels. Gospel according to or written by Matthew and then Luke and Mark and John. Who are the disciples, uh, eyewitness, who had lived three years together with Jesus and uh, being discipled or taught by Jesus as, this, uh, as students. And they record 
what had happened. And the, the reason for the having full gospel, they have different perspectives, number one. People, I mean, you and I, and every individual, even though within the family, pa father and mother, son and daughters, they have very distinctive and different perspectives. Not any you know, individual view the things the same. They are different. And when you read a, a narrative story or episode or drama, watch drama or movies, as the directors or writers of view, the perspective, it only represents certain perspective. It does not, you know, that's never possible. It cannot write or represent or express everyone's perspective. That's not possible. So knowing that limitation, God had allowed, God had allowed at least four different person, people, the disciples to record what Jesus had done and how he loved and who he is. And uh, Somehow, these three people, the Matthew, Luke, and the Mark, kind of share the uh, uh, same perspective, uh, even though they are not exactly, but there are some common elements as they represent the, the history of Jesus and the disciples. So we call them synoptic gospel meaning they have in common perspective. While the John, it's not the John the Baptist, this is a John the disciple. This John the disciple, he writes kind of a little different compared to these three. So as John's gospel is more unique than these three. So the reason, the answer to the four, why the four gospels to represent more broader or three uh, D, three dimensional perspective to the story, and then not only perspectives but the themes. Because of the different perspective, the themes are different. Especially John, he kind of tried to share the theme of like a when you read the John's Gospel, there are these themes repeatedly, it shows repeatedly. Lagos, light and life, water and so on. So he tried to write it with a kind of slightly different themes. What what it says is when you look at these narratives, you know, trying to see how the church began and developed and what are the, uh, the key elements, the principles uh, for the church is. Now they are going to show you different perspectives. So each gospel has its value in doing an early church history. And then style is different and also audiences are different. Some write only for the Jews, Jews only, while the other writes for the others as well. Writing styles, each, even though we believe these four Gospels are 
directed, yeah, that, that's what would be the word, directed and inspired by the Holy Spirit, still, the Holy Spirit allows each writer, the author, to show their own character, their own style, their own person, personality in, in their writings. So they are writing kind of different writing style, except when they quote, quote the word of Jesus Christ, even while doing so, they kind of sometimes omit or skip certain portion and do certain editing because they have different interest, different perspective. When the readers are different, your writing is going to be different. As I teach, I mean, if I teach the, the elementary students, it's going to be a lot different than uh, the teaching I do at this college level, right? And if you're teaching the Koreans, Korean students only, then my teaching is going to be a little somehow, somewhat different than doing to more like international uh, students, right? So audiences make a difference. And so there's a synoptic and John's gospel I already told you about. It. So Jesus and his church. Okay, now this is the key to this lesson. And uh, it's, it's probably only the beginning about the, the uh, doing of early church history, but this is very fundamental and uh, important as, as you try to read other church history, the history of Acts there, and then his history of the early fathers. Early fathers are the the, the, the Christian leaders who they didn't know the apostles but the next generation to the apostles. They are not the apostles, the apostles, but they learned, had learned or disciple, discipled by the apostles. These are so-called early fathers. And though when you're trying to do those studies, the very funda foundation is Jesus and his uh, the, his disciples. So, large part, large part of uh, this, uh, the readings from the four Gospels, we take out certain passages that are relevant, relevant to the doing of uh, the church history or understanding the church. So to do the uh, church history, we gotta know what the church is before we we try to understand what church did and does. <clears throat> Excuse me. Many many all kind of mistake doing church history as trying to find what church did did but the reason that we do the uh, read what church did or investigate and study what the church did is to know what the church is so uh, please uh, try not to forget the the essence of the church history whether it's early church history or modern church history as we look at what church does or did, we go back to what the church should be, what the church is. And because of that nature, we try to found, found, found our, ourselves and to, to build ourselves on the base of these words from the Bible. Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. So this is the very definition or the biblical, not only is a biblical definition, but it's 
Jesus' own word. That's what Jesus had told his disciples. So according to Jesus of Nazareth, who is the, the head and the key, the center of the church, he said this. This is the church where two or three gathered in my name. What does it, my name mean? It is as Jesus and Christ. Again, Jesus means the Savior, one who saves. The, the Christ means the Messiah in, 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 in Greek form. So, Jesus the Messiah, the, the Savior the Messiah, that's the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the, the son of uh, Joseph of uh, Nazareth, Galilee. So this Galilean or Nazarene said, in my name, Jesus, the Savior, under the name, when you're gathered, so gathering is another component of the church. And then said, I'm among them. Jesus being with them together and uh, being the center of that gathering and the purpose of the gathering. So the church, the purpose of the church is the, the Jesus, the Christ, the Savior, the, the Messiah, the King. So his kingship, the messiahship, or the is a is a, a savior, being a savior. These are the key elements of the church and what the church is, and because of what the church is, that's going to be what the church does. So the kingdom, again, is in the part of his name. The Savior more has to do with the church, while the, the Messiah more has to do with the kingdom, the kingship. So again, by looking at this only uh, recording or the definition of the church, we go back to what the church is. And by knowing that, from that, uh, the essence, the fun foundation, then we try to find ourselves a doing of church. Next. Again, it's from the Matthew chapter 16 and two verses, verse 18 and verse, verse 19. Uh, this is what Jesus uh, told Peter. Jesus is speaking to the Peter. This is before the, uh, uh, the, the crucifixion or resurrection. And this is what Jesus told uh, Peter. And I, Jesus, tell you, to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Here, the Jesus used that word church, ecclesia, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, there are several elements. I mean, that verse alone is worth for the whole uh, class, the whole, I mean, couple hours worth of study is there. But I'll try to be brief because it's not like a real, real exposition that we are doing, but a sort of uh, exposition and trying to get uh, the key elements relevant to uh, the church history. So the Peter means Peter in Petros in in uh, Greek. Petros means it means the rock. I mean that's the word for the rock in uh, in Greek. So you are the Petros. That's kind of you know. Jesus calls Peter, whose name was Simon, right? And uh, 
this nickname this is a nickname Peter is a nickname and says you are you Simon you are going to be called nickname Peter the rock and uh, the reason Jesus named uh, Simon as Peter is because you are going to be the foundation of my church what does it mean because Peter is the very first one who actually gave the gospel confession meaning indeed you are the son of God and the, the, the very Messiah the Savior and the Messiah that's kind of confession that is very acute and relevant to becoming a believer so out of these 12 disciples Peter is the first one who actually realized realized and acknowledge acknowledge and confirm the faith faith of Jesus as Messiah so the reason Jesus called uh, Peter as the rock the foundation because you know when you build a house you need to have a foundation you can either build on the solid This is a, a parable given by Jesus. I mean, he said, if you build a, a house on the sand, when there's flood, the sand is going to be taken away and your house is going to crumble. That's kind of parable that Jesus told you. Jesus wanted the church to, to build on the solid rock. So what is a solid rock? It's a genuine confession about the, the, the saviorship and then the, the kingship, the messiahship of Jesus Christ. Without that, the church is not a church. So what do we learn from here? That very confession, who Jesus is, identifying Jesus of Nazareth as the son, very son of God the Messiah and the Savior that's going to be the very foundation to a church and thus the, the gate of hell shall not prevail against it meaning that the death the death spiritual death the death as the judgment about us. So we just talked about uh, this Peter, the rock, and again, uh, the, 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 you know, Jesus, this is what Jesus uh, told Peter, and he used the word, the church. And the thing is, verse 18 and 19 here is trying to say what the, you know, Jesus, Jesus is trying to teach about the church and what the church does and the church exists for the kingdom okay uh, another kind of a symbolic language that Jesus used to uh, set teach the image or the being and doing about the church is in the we find in Matthew chapter 9 verse 15 let's try to read it first and Jesus said to them the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them can they but the day will come the day will come 
when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will. So Jesus ta is talking about himself as the bridegroom. There is another, you know, imagery about the church. Is saying he is the bridegroom and the church is a bride. You find that in the uh, book of Revelation. So Jesus him, describes himself as a bridegroom and while the church becomes his bride. And uh, this, this figurative language or symbolic language, uh, it does show about the relationship between the Jesus and uh, his church. And he, he's telling the church that he will be taken away from them. Taken away from them. It talks about his own death. And then the church we mourn. But right away we find that Jesus was resurrected. Uh, so what's the relationship between the bridegroom and the bride or husband and the wife? It's very close very intimate the church to Jesus Christ is very close that what he is trying to say is the mission of Jesus who Jesus is is going to be projected and reflected through the church it's not two separate entity <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus is church and church is for the Jesus. Jesus is for the church. So they are just like a one. Even though they are two distinctive entity, they become one because of the mission. What is the mission? The mission is the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. And Head of the church. Jesus, you know, talks about himself in regard to the church, not only as a bride to a bridegroom, a bridegroom to bride, but he also uses that uh, figure of a person, a human being, and he is the head, head of the church, head of a human being. In Ephesians 1 22, and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. So this is what Paul wrote to people, the church of in, on, in Ephesus. It's now part of uh, the Turkey, I believe, the nation of Turkey. Uh, <clears throat> so, here, what we read is very unique. Had it thinks, it gives the, I mean, it kind of manages and controls the whole body, the brain. You know, it, it does control your hands and your feet and your heart and your mind, your thinking and your decision, your emotion. All of these happens right up here. So it's the center. It's the, 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 the most important part. Without head, you're not, you're not going to live, right? So that's the, the figure of the church. 
See, without understanding these essence, that you're not understanding the church, there's no value in talking about what church does. But you need to understand. So this head, headship, headship is about the authority, it's about the, 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 the responsibility, it's centeredness, and all things and uh, are condensed in the, this language of headship. Good Shepherd, John 10, 11, it's John's Gospel, this one. In John's Gospel, I'm the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Here the sheep is the church. Sheep is the church. Because it's people of Jesus. The children of Jesus Christ. That's what, what the sheep is representing here. And then there is shepherd. Shepherd is one who is caring and protecting and guiding and feeding the sheep. It's responsibility of shepherd. So we, the sheep, depend totally, totally on the shepherd for all our protection, our guidance, and our survival, because we need to be fed. And the church, as the, the, the gathering of these sheep, we do follow Jesus, because he is going to guide us. We trust Jesus because he is the one who is going to protect us. And we depend on him for survival. So that's kind of relationship between the church and the Jesus shepherd. The thing is, the lesson from the history, history tells us that many try to break away from Jesus Christ. They forget about the centeredness, the headship of Jesus Christ, that we, we do not try to focus on that Jesus is the shepherd. Then, when that happens, the church is no longer a church. So without shepherd, without head, without bridegroom, we the 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 the, the you know these people who call themselves a church is no longer a church. So the whole thing, whole thing so far and then, then later on is always centered on that the Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Gospel and Kingdom. These four Gospels, four Gospels, the record of the very beginning of the church. It talks about the kingdom and the gospel. These are very two central themes of the church. So when we say we are the church, or we are doing the church, and when, when we read about the church, and when we see ourselves as a church, the, the theme, gospel and the kingdom, is the thrust, the main theme. Thrust is the energy and direction that any entity that is going about. So it's a thrust. The, the power and the energy and the direction. 
So the thrust of Jesus, uh, the church is the gospel and the kingdom. You need to remember this. So as, as we even review our own history, current church history, it's not of, of so much about what we do and how we do, what the system is, how uh, we, we organize the church, but it's more about the gospel and the kingdom. That's the essence, that's foundation. And uh, unfortunately, many church leaders and the church, uh, the teachers, pastors, they kind of minimize, minimized the, the importance of the gospel and the kingdom. Once you lose that, we, once, once you kind of uh, diminish the importance of these two uh, ma major thrust, the church becomes, it's no longer a church. It might be the, you know, individuals, individual believers being there, but it's no longer a church. The church becomes a church when these individual believers kind of come together under the one major thrust, the theme, the gospel and the kingdom. So that's kind of uh, the spirit that inspires the whole church. Once the church keep being inspired by this thrust, the theme, gospel and the kingdom, then it is life life it is active and it's genuine so once you lose these two things you lose the essence of the church so gospel and the kingdom david to jesus of nazareth when you read the gospel you're going to find the descendant the descendant of of King David. The word very the, the word the descendant of the David the king that means the Messiah. The same as the Messiah. So Jesus of Nazareth he is the question is is he you know the right person to be called the descendant or this the son of the King David David the king. So that's one kind of one measure to verify, verify whether Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah or not. And then there is a baptism. And then the Holy Spirit, according to the, the gospel, the Holy Spirit claims Jesus of Nazareth to be my beloved son. This is a very unique but important phrase. God the Father uses this language to only one person. Only one person. My beloved son, there is only one. And we may be the children, beloved children, but we are not the son. So after the baptism, the Holy Spirit acknowledged Jesus of Nazareth as the beloved son. Then we have those kingdom parables. Now Jesus begins to teach his disciples. And when he teach, he loves to use these parables. And majority of the parables are so-called kingdom parables. It teaches about the kingdom of God. 
So Jesus begins his story by saying, the kingdom of God is like, or it is, is compared to, and then the story begins. Story about uh, four different uh, grounds. The, the the farmer goes out to, you know, uh, plant his the seed, and then one falls onto the street, one falls as a hard uh, surface, one falls into the uh, the, the 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 the. the Field with a lot of stones. One falls. One seed falls between among the uh, thorns, and then one seed falls in onto the good uh, field. So that's kind of a story. I mean, there are many of these stories, and they, they are called parables. And that's about the kingdom. So what does it say? Church, when you're becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ or Christians for today's uh, uh, word and definition. You are, you are becoming a kingdom person. Your, your, your mandate, your thoughts, your perspectives, your the very first primary agenda in life, in your life is come, going to become the kingdom. So the gospel, Gospel is about Jesus Christ as Jesus as the Messiah and it is about the news of the kingdom. The, so the king and the kingdom is the main contents of the gospel. So we can say when we say gospel and the kingdom and we can uh, rephrase re that saying Gospel is about the kingdom and the king. Because kingdom includes the king. I mean, you can say gospel is about the kingdom. It's a message of the kingdom. Many times, people today, many Christians believe gospel is about the salvation, which is true. But I say it's partially true. When you miss the kingdom while you're focusing and saying about the salvation, and that's kind of like a half truth. Half truth is not bad, but it's not complete. It's not good. A good is good when it is complete. And tell the truth. But the whole truth and the whole truth and not the, and the whole truth so truth has to be whole and the, the gospel of salvation is a, a just part of it so we talk about gospel of the kingdom not only gospel and the kingdom it's gospel of the kingdom gospel about the kingdom coming king Today, many church teaches only about the, the Jesus Christ who came and died and resurrected and lifted up, ascended. They miss about the coming kingdom. But Jesus himself did emphasize always when, when that was possible. Of, talked about him coming back again especially when he was resurrected for 40 days he had, had to stay with his disciples because he wanted to emphasize and teach that he is going to indeed going to come back and the, the reason for he, him leaving for uh, this many many years until now today is because of the kingdom. We need to be part of, we need to be 
and preparing for the kingdom. So again, when you do the church history, history, try not to forget about the kingdom. It's always about the kingdom. The church is for the kingdom, gospel of the kingdom. It's not gospel of the church, but it is gospel of the kingdom. It's not only about the salvation, but it is about the coming king. To claim, to claim and to complete the kingdom. The reason for his second coming is not for us to be raptured. It is an important event for us individually as a believer, but that's not the ultimate, the ultimate the reason for us being raptured and uh, that there, there's going to be final judgment and so on is because the kingdom has to be completed. Matthew 21 9 says, The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. I told you that, uh, about this. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. So this, these are the, 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 the shoutings of people as Jesus enters to Jerusalem. This is the last time that Jesus enters to Jerusalem. And then Thursday, he does have his final meal and the, the celebration then he was crucified on the Friday so just exactly one week prior to his resurrection that Jesus enters Jerusalem for the uh, last time and the people were saying this with, whether they really really truly knew this or not but when you say the son of David, it means it's the Messiah, the king, the coming king. That, uh, I mean, expected, waited, long waited Messiah indeed comes to claim his kingdom. So the kingdom is very key to his, his work and ministry. Again, we go back to the very first message that Jesus had said after his baptism. Matthew 4, 17. From the time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The repentance is requirement for the salvation. Repent and believing in Jesus the Messiah. But repentance is only the gateway to the kingdom. So this, again, here's a theology, the doctrine. Our belief, our faith, and our mandate as a believer does not end with the salvation. It's only the beginning. It's like a, you know, marriage. When you have the marriage ceremony, the wedding ceremony. That's only one day. And then that's not the end of marriage. It's only the beginning. So salvation is like a, that wedding ceremony. You enter into uh, the, that engagement, that relationship as a husband and wife. But it follows with the living as a couple husband and wife and then having children and nurturing them and creating a home see that's that's kind of the key it can be compared to the kingdom so salvation is the beginning and the church should not just limit it to the message of salvation but also to the kingdom it should be extended so looking at the very first message Jesus preached right after the baptism 
of the Holy Spirit and baptism of John the Baptist. This is the very, I mean, it shows. Because when you, your first word as the Messiah, I mean, as the, 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 the uh, anointed king, it, it has to have the, the most important things in the message. And these are, the kingdom is emphasized. John Gospel John John's Gospel eighteen chapter eighteen verse thirty six. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. So here, Jesus talks about the world and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is beyond this world. It is over this world. It is different from this world. So we, we should not imagine Jesus as the worldly king which the Iscariot Judah, the Judah who sold uh, Jesus, he had thought Jesus as the worldly king, the political king, he's not. So what Jesus basically saying is, here is, my kingdom is different from this worldly kingdom. If a church tried to pursue the kingdom just as like a worldly people does uh, seek a, a political kingdom, that is wrong. That's what Jesus is saying. So do not mistake me as the earthly king. I'm heavenly king. And uh, it, it, it kind of shed a very different perspective about the living, the reality, and the, our existence. See, I, I kept telling you this formula. The reality of the world, this is the world. And then what we believe about the world, it brings and determines our existence. When you say you are a believer in your church, but sees the reality as any other people, secular people, who are without Jesus, who are without faith. If you see the same, then your belief is not true belief. Because it is a belief that is going to determine your existence. So by looking at someone else, someone's existence, it is possible to guess to assume their belief. And the kingdom citizen, the church, true church, if you're a true church and the genuine, if your faith and your belief is genuine, then you're going to bring the, that genuine existence. Here, not everyone who's exhibiting the soul look look like a genuine existence because only we can see uh, the existence by their words and action that uh, they they may not not all of them may not have the genuine belief because 
there's those so-called hypocrites, hypocrites, who does not have that belief, but may show some, some, you know, aspects of this genuine Christian existence. But as if it is consistent, whether someone is looking at you or not, that's the key element. You, you, you want to exhibit the, the kind of ex existence that a so-called Christian, but to be consistent, do you do it when nobody's watching you? That's going to be the key question. Because you, you don't, I mean, we don't so much care about how others uh, view me, but we are very sensitive, we should be very sensitive about how God views us. And you are alone by yourself, and no one is watching. If you are aware of that, God is still watching you. Then you are going to behave and exhibit this genuine Christian existence. So that's a kind of lesson that we need to learn. Jesus and his disciples. When you read these four Gospels, the God, four Gospels are full of record about these disciples, the 12 of them. First 12, and then there are 70 of them, and then there's multitude. When, disciples, all right, another word, it's followers of Jesus Christ. They're learning, they're practicing, and they're practicing the very existence, the kingdom, kind of kingdom existence. And the reason Jesus chose the, only the 12 is because of our limited ability. Jesus taught, thought the maximum number of people that you can care in very biblical per and the personal, interpersonal way is maximum would be 12. And then even Jesus could not control the one who has It's gone against Jesus, Judah. He had abandoned all the teachings. So that's kind of a limit that Jesus shows us, the example. So for us, probably four, five would be the maximum number of disciples that we can disciple at the given time and the duration of time. And uh, the lesson here, the discipling, nurturing, and making a, 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 a mature follower, a disciple, is the key function and the responsibility of a church. When you're a church, when you're, you're a, a, a member of a church, your responsibility would be primary, first, most important responsibility would be to raise a disciple, a good one, a mature disciple. To, to do so, you have to be mature yourself. Without your own maturity, you will never be able to disciple anyone. The sad thing is, unfortunately, many churches Many churches trust and trust this leadership to the very immature Christians and even to the non-believers. They, they do not confirm their genuine faith in the gospel and the kingdom and bring them as the, the, the teachers and leaders and even pastors. 
So that's, that's very devastating, devastating, and they're very destructive and critical. So the lesson, our lesson from early church history, to conclude, to conclude, I mean, always we run out of time, but you know, uh, to conclude the, this uh, study about the early church history on the reading, based on the reading of four gospels, or for the reading of four gospels actually, is that the church is about people, the believer, genuine believer, and the, the kingdom. And uh, so that's what Jesus had taught, and then what we need to learn. Uh, we'll continue. I mean, you'll continue to learn about this church, uh, early church history, by reading the four gospels and finding out the truth about the four gospels. Again, uh, thank you uh, for spending 10 uh, weeks uh, the lessons with me. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I hope and pray to see you again in uh, some other classes. But until then, uh, enjoy yourself, uh, the vacation, and then just, I'll see you guys again. Thanks, and God bless.